Holy cow! Uh, welcome to the 3% Podcast. This is Chad Post here from Open Letter. I'm here with Tamara Barish from Albertine. I don't know if you want to say hi. <laughs> I am saying hello. <laughs> hello. And um, we are doing podcast today, which is Tuesday, April 19th, the morning that the, in the afternoon of the morning when the Best Translated Book Award shortlists were released. Um, and on I think. Millions. On the millions, um, to give them a plug, which they did a fantastic job putting that up there. And they will be announcing the winners as well on May 4th. So today on the podcast, we're going to talk about that, about the shortlist for poetry and for fiction. And then we're also going to talk about the Reading the World book club books for this month. Um, we're sort of a month behind, essentially, and I think we're going to change it so that it's like one a fiction book one month and the poetry book the next and go back and forth and slow it down so that people can participate more readily. And because I'm going to be gone for most of May and June. Um, oh, really? I'll be, I'll be gone for a couple of weeks in June too. So yeah, yeah. Work, work great. All right. So work out perfectly. Um, and besides, yeah, I mean, I could still do it, but it's going to be tricky. Um, this month is insane. I have so many events, but, uh, so we want to talk about all that stuff and the, and then talk about the, the, just so this is on there. The poetry book this time was Diorama by Rocio Cerrone, translated by Anna Rosenwong, which won the best translated book award last year, which is why we chose to use that. And then the fiction book is by Han Kang, and it's The Vegetarian, which is translated by Deborah Smith, um, and came out in the UK a year ago, and then in the US this year. Um, but I guess we start with the the shortlist for fiction and poetry. Um, I'll just read through. Do you want me to read through the poetry ones really quick? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so the poetry ones are Rilke Shake by Angelica Fritas, translated from the Portuguese by Hilary Kaplan, and published by Phoneme. Empty Chair, Selected Poems by Lu Xia, translated from the Chinese by Ming Di and Jennifer Stern, published by Grey Wolf. Um, Load Poems Like Guns, Women's Poetry from Herat, Afghanistan, edited and translated from the Persian by Farzana Marie, and published by Holy Cow Press. <laughs> um, and then Salvino Campo by Salvino Campo, translated from the Spanish by Jason Weiss, and published by New York Review Books. Um, then The Nomads My Brothers Go Out to Drink from the Big Dipper by Abdurrahman uh, Wabiri, translated from the French by Nancy Naomi Carlson and published by Seagull. And then finally, Sea Summit by Yi Lu, translated from the Chinese by Fiona Celo Lorraine and published by Milkweed. Um, I don't know if you I haven't read any of these, to be honest. I, I do want to read the Empty Chairs one, and I do want to read Abdurrahman Wabiri's because I really like him. Um, I actually met him in Montreal this weekend. Oh, yeah, you were in Montreal. Yeah, right. for the Bloom Metropolis Festival, and he was one of the big guests there. So, And it was great. I ran into him a few times, um, and he's super funny and, and really, really cool and nice. So I, I kind of pulling for him. But it's interesting. This one has two Chinese books on it. That's, that was going to be my very first comment. Um, and most, it's, all, it's five women and one man. One man. One man. One man. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty, pretty diverse, interesting list, I think. Um, Chinese, Portuguese from Brazil. Yeah, the Spanish Afghanistan from- one is. Uh, yeah, the Afghanistan one's random in a way. Like, yeah. I didn't even hear of that book really until it popped up for this. Um, phonemes on here again, and they won last year. They're they're pretty strong as like a, a small press doing a lot of poetry. And my guess is that uh, I don't know who's gonna win. Either the Afghanistan book or Wabiri. Oh, no, maybe Silvino Campo. Is that, is, is that a living poet? Uh, which one? The Ocampo? No, no, no. She's from the 20s and 30s, oh, Argentine. Okay. She's, the, she's mostly known for fiction. Okay. She was part of like the Borges Bior Casares. That, that, that era? Yes. I think, in fact, wasn't that she involved with... Uh, Oh, is that true? With Bioy Casares? Um, it's possible. He was married. I think he was involved with one of the Acampo sisters, and I can't remember which one. Because um, they had their magazine and all that kind of stuff. 
Her sister was Victoria. Um, yes, so Silvina was the one that was married to Adolfo B. I. Casares. Which, but, as we're making notes of all the books we discuss, that is, uh, he wrote an amazing book that I think uh, we've probably discussed here before, no? Which one? Invention of Morale? The Invention of Morale, yeah. That's the one that I put on uh, the TV show Lost. Oh, right. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I love that book. Which um, I've never seen, so... <laughs> no, no comment. That, it, that episode of Lost included Vallis and Invention of Morale. Wait, Vallis, the Philip K. Dick book? Yep. Interesting. Yeah, those were the two that he wanted to end up working in, the guy that wrote it, Greg, uh, Greg uh, Nations. Yeah, I think um, that the Reading the World uh, book club thing, we were talking about using Empty Chairs as like the next one just because it's on the shortlist and it's Chinese and it's from Grey Wolf and it makes sense. And it's a, she's a uh, woman poet, so um, we'll probably get to be able to talk about that maybe in more detail later. But other than that, I haven't read any of these. And I think the, the, the Afghanistan one is interesting as a concept, and I could see that getting some pull, although it's kind of weird because it has eight authors. Yeah, those are always tricky, right? Yeah, I think it's hard to like the fiction generally immediately eliminates any anthology. The um, judges generally do because it doesn't seem to be it's impossible to compare that to right thing. And it seems like with this, like one of the problems I think with short stories, it's come up because I run a similar sort of contest like this in the in my class. And short story collections always have this problem where if one story is is bad or that you don't like one particular story, it tends to be overvalued when you look at the book as a whole and think of like the book as being not as strong as a novel, even though the novel might have like five or 10 pages that are like not very good either. Um, but since it's not separated out as a story, you can kind of gloss over that. And I think with um, something like this that has multiple, multiple authors, if one of the poets is like not as interesting to you as a judge or as a reader as the other ones, it'll over reflect and be, not as interesting. So it'd be hard for that to win. Yeah, but it can go the other way too, right? Yeah, if something's if something's spectacularly good. Yeah. Like if one story is just, you know, amazing. Well, people well, tend to halo downwards, I think. Yes, you're probably right. The, All right, should we do the uh the fiction list? Yeah, although I want to make one last this is my my haloing downwards negative comment is that out of this so we have the five five of the authors are women and there's one man. There's so many articles that have come out about like the the gender imbalance in all of these prizes, how they're always just all male writers, all male writers, all this kind of stuff. And we have an example in which it is the opposite, the counter example. And I'll bet mm-hmm. you no one writes about that in a positive way. No, or at least not in depth. No, nope, it know. They really only want to have the negative, the, to be able to say that something did something wrong instead of taking a moment to say when someone did something right. Right. That's true. But oh, we didn't mention the judges. Right, which I have in front of me. So the judges for this are Jared Annis, Katrine Ogar Jensen, Tess Lewis, Becca McKay, and Deborah Smith, yes. who we'll be talking about later. Yes, we will. Uh, because she translated the vegetarian. All right, now. On to the fiction finalists. Um, should we read them in the order that they're here on the website? I suppose so. Sure, they're alphabetical. Alphabetical by author, yes. Yeah. All right, go ahead. You can start. Okay. General Theory of Oblivion by Jose Eduardo Agalusa, translated from the Portuguese by Daniel Hahn and published by Archipelago. Um, was this a surprise to you? Um, a little bit, although I, I just saw Danny, um, in, in Montreal as well. Um, and I, I really like him and like him as a translator and, uh, as a person and as a figure that does a lot of stuff related to international literature. So for him, I don't think it's a surprise. And I, and I know that a lot of people like Agualusa. I've only read one of his books and it wasn't my favorite and I haven't read this one. So I'm not, I don't, I don't even know how to judge it. Um, but with the, I'm trying to pull up the the other long list or the other titles that are on there. Like I, I, I was surprised by that a few things didn't make it. Um, oh, well, we can get to that after. Yeah. So this one, I will say, and I can't remember which judge had said it, um, somewhere along the way that this might not be his best book. Uh-huh. He's so damn good that it's still really good. You know what I mean? Okay. So, um, up next, Arvida by Samuel Ark. Archibald, translated from the French 
by Donald Winkler uh, from Biblio Oasis. Um, this, I think, you know, not to give too much away, was, you know, this was the horse that started last out of the gate and, uh, you know, caught up to the pack, is, uh, is how I can put it. <laughs> um, very, very pleasantly surprised to see this on here. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited for this because it is interesting to have a uh, Quebecois author um, yes. and Bibli Oasis that's doing more stuff in translation. And this book is the one that we talked about. We like the cover. I, I think it sounds really cool. I have had a copy somewhere, although I think someone took it to review it. Um, but I, I want to read this at some point in time. And then the next one, The Story of the Lost Child by Elena Fronte, translated from the Italian by Anne Goldstein and published by Europa Editions, is definitely not a surprise. <laughs> uh, no, not a surprise. Um, I feel like we've talked about this book and Anne Goldstein and translations from the Italian quite enough for yep. one. The only, one. Well, there's yeah. one thing to add. What if it wins? It is one of the two books that... So General Theory of Oblivion is on the Man Booker shortlist. And so is this. So she could, one of the two could, could win both of them. We shall see. Um, where am I? General no, Physics of Sorrow by Georgi Gasparinov, translated from the Bulgarian by Angela Rodell, and published by you, Open Letter. Yeah, I want this one, obviously. I yeah. love this book. I love this book as well. Um, I really, really think it's like a work of art. Um, again, we've been over that so many times. Yeah. But um, really, people, if you're just listening, you haven't, you know, listened to previous episodes for whatever reason, go, go buy this book. It's really good. Absolutely. Please do. Um, next is Science Preceding the End of the World by Yuri Herrera, translated from the Spanish by Lisa Dillman and published by And Other Stories. I actually got his new book in today. I didn't know he had a new book. Is it yeah. also with and other stories? It is, and it's the transmigration of bodies. Then it's okay. slim as well. I don't remember. I don't. I can see it on the shelf, but I can't reach it. Um, not sure what it's about, but he's he's an interesting Mexican writer. I think he actually lives in um, New Orleans. Um, yeah, I got curious the other day where he lived, and uh, could not decipher it to save my life. So. Uh, up next, Moods by Joel Hoffman, translated from the Hebrew by Peter Cole, and published by New Directions. There you go. There's one of one of your 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 people. One of my people, my former people. Um, yeah. This might seem a surprise to some people, but I will say the judges have been drooling over this since day one, so not a surprise. I think one of his earlier books was long listed, if not short listed, as well. Really? I mean, this yep. would have been years ago, right? Um, I can picture what apartment I was living in when I was putting this <laughs> together. So, yeah, I think it was like 2010, maybe. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to see if, I can, if I'm right about that. Uh, but, yeah, they, and I remember reading it and really enjoying it, too. Um, but this one I haven't looked at at all. I've read, read so little now. Um, next is The Complete Stories by Clarice the Spectre, translated from the Portuguese by Katrina Dodson and published again by New Directions. Which, not a surprise. Not a surprise. Not at all. And that's that's so New Directions has two books on the list, which is one of the only two presses that got more than one. And you would be the other. That's true. Uh, up next, the story of my teeth by Valeria Luiselli, translated from the Spanish by Christina McSweeney, and published by our friends at Coffee House Press. Exactly. Also not a surprise. <laughs> also not a surprise. I mean, it just recently won the LA Times award LA right. time I don't know what that's called award uh, for fiction yeah. um which is not just a translation thing obviously so uh congrats to her it's a big deal yeah uh, so yeah it's not surprising it's been on everyone's list people have been raving about it since it came out so she too is in Montreal I saw her ah okay and the next one is War So Much War by Merce Rodoreda, translated from the Catalan by Marusha Rolano and Martha Tennant. Um, and this one's from Open Letter as well. And that's our uh, their book, which I love this book too. I love Rodoreda wholeheartedly and hope that we're going to do a couple more books of hers in the next few years. And last but not least, Murder Most Serene by Gabrielle Whitkop, translated from the French by Louise Rogers Lalori, um, published by Wakefield Press. And it's great to see a Wakefield press on here. Yes, on here. totally agree. They are such good people running that, that place. We're really glad to get uh, you know, a little bit of a press here. Yeah. So 
I mean, it's really unfair for me to uh, project what might happen here, so I will, I will abstain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, I'll just say that I was the ones that I was the ones I thought would make it that I most strongly thought would make it and didn't were nowhere to be found by Besoa, and then either Trimity Three or Sphinx. I thought one of the two would be on there. And then, From uh, Deep Film. Yeah, and then maybe the four books one. I haven't read that. Um, I don't know how much I can give away here, but uh, some of those were close to making it. Uh-huh. Um, but there was definitely, like, like, of this list, I will say, there's like six that were sort of surefire, and then it was the other four that were being sort of debated. Uh, uh-huh. And some of those ones you mentioned were in that mix as well. Yeah. It's still pretty solid. Got a it's lot of a solid list. Yes, I misled everyone too. So if you're listening to this and you and you played my little game yesterday with the clues, I made a huge mistake. I was rushing to do that because I had to go pick up the kids, um, throwing this together, and I miscounted and said that there are eight languages represented. There are only seven. Um, so people were trying to figure out who made the short list based on those clues, and it was impossible because I had lied <laughs> accidentally. Um. Yeah, the two Mexicans. I counted Portuguese twice by accident when I was doing it in my mind. But, yeah, so whatever. But there's, there's an, I forget how many, I have this all right here, but there's a, also like, is that eight different countries? Um, here it is. Where is it? Okay. So, yeah, so there are eight, there are nine different countries, yes. seven different languages, eight different publishers, five men and five women. And eight of the translators are women. So again, gender gender parity, or in favor of women in the in terms of the translators. Um, and the winner will be announced on May fourth at seven p.m. at on the Millions website, and then at the Folly, which is ninety two West Houston Street in New York City. So come at like six thirty. We'll start. We'll do some sort of improv thing, I suppose. But which we do not mean improv comedy at all. <laughs> not my forte. It, maybe, it could accidentally be funny, though. Um, it might actually accidentally be funny. Uh, yeah, no, I think we. I mean, we're trying to get somebody from the millions. Um, they are in a weird period of transition right now because uh, Max stepped down and somebody right. else stepped up, and um, our good friend Garth is uh, sort of busy with other things these days. Um, so I don't know. We're trying to find somebody. Uh, otherwise, it'll just be you and me uh, up there um, announcing, like like in the good old days. Yeah. Although we could MC. I know that the poetry, the, a couple of the judges will be there, and they're, they're, they can announce their winner. Um, uh, yeah, I think a couple of the fiction judges will be around. Heather, I'm pretty sure. Kate. Yeah. Um, uh, that might be about it, actually. Those uh, are the two that I did live in New York. So, they, right, right. Uh, um, yeah, and, then and there is, let's not forget the party the following week, uh, and maybe a discussion slash reading that I think Kevin Elliott, um, judge and uh, bookseller at 57th Street is trying to set up. I don't know where it's going to, it's on, um, yeah, it's May 11th at, from 5 till 6 30 at 57th Street Books. Um, but I don't know what the actual event is. Has he reached, he's reached out to some of the judges I know who will be there to talk about the process or what they think, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I assume you and he are probably in more touch about that than I am because I won't be there. It's his his game. His game. All right. So we should at this point and and every point in which judges are mentioned to thank them all again. They are Amanda Bullock, Heather Cleary, Kevin Elliott, Kate Garber, Jason Grunbaum, Mark Haber, Stacy Connect, Amanda Nelson, and uh, Patrick Smith, P.T. Smith. Um, they've been doing a great job. Yeah, and they have to go through a so, lot of books. Yes, it's it's. I mean, you know, because you put the, uh, the all database. the books in the database. Database meaning you know spreadsheet. It's just massive. It's so so insanely massive. Yeah, uh, trying to wade through it all and make sure every book that's actually submitted um, comes through and, and, and is looked at. It's just massive. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, yeah, I don't know what else to add to that. Yeah, to, it'll be interesting to see. And we do have, we do have, we will have like little awards. Yes, we are. We are bringing back the trophies. <laughs> Bring back, yeah, the, anyone who remembers this from days on old, there were uh, these um, apostrophe bookend trophies. They were, they were apostrophe bookends, and then there was like a metal thing on them that stated like who the winner was and all that kind of all the good information. And those went out of commission they were no longer designed and sold a few years ago and so he stumbled around looking for things that didn't look super hokey like a, uh like the sort of trophy you get at like a, a softball rec league um and then you found some that work pretty well that are nice and and glass and look like they'll be etched and and respectable so we're printing them actually we're making them for the author the translator and the publisher oh wow Wow, well done. Because we figure, like, if there's some people go into the publisher's office, they can see this little thing on display and be like, what is that? And then they can find out about the Best Translated Book Awards. I mean, that's why I had never been involved. Like, I didn't know there were trophies oh. until working for New Directions, and Jeffrey Yang had one in his office. Right, yeah. That's and awesome. I think, I don't know whether he was the translator or... He was. He was. Because, I don't know, I feel like he maybe, like, I'm not even sure it was that one. I feel like New Directions had one for something, and he just, like, never gave it to the translator or something like that. That and actually might be true. I think that was the case. And he's like, yeah, I've just had it all these years. And it was just, like, <laughs> being used as a bookend <laughs> on its shelves. So, I was like, oh, oh God, I wish we still had these trophies. So <laughs> That's that's awesome. You did. Um, I would have been very happy to give out trophies with like you know wrestlers on in singlets at the top <laughs> i feel like there's a metaphor in there wrestling language translation oh man yeah yep it, it doesn't have the uh, the gravity perhaps that we're looking for i don't i think you would be the one who would enjoy that the most <laughs> probably <laughs> seeing as i'm kind of just an innocent bystander here perhaps not appropriate <laughs> oh man so um should we move on to talking about these books? Uh, yes, you're 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 going to talk about the poetry. <laughs> um, I honestly have been reading. I too have. I have to moderate an event uh, next week at the bookstore. Which one? Uh, are you, what are you doing? What event is it? Uh, it's a French. I guess let's call him French. He wrote in. He writes in French. Uh, an author named Karim Miske has written a book called Arab Jazz. Sounds uh, familiar. It's coming out from Mackle House now. Uh, um, maybe it's already available in the UK. Um, and it's a sort of, it was written in 2000, I'm going to say 11 or 12. Um, and it takes place in Paris in a, in a mixed religion, sort of low income uh, neighborhood. Uh, and it's, you know, a detective story um, that sort of becomes international um, you know, all of the issues that are like now all these years later, not that many years, but, you know, five, six years later, um, incredibly still relevant uh, in Paris because of everything that's happened in the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, we were looking for someone to moderate it and they were like, well, Tom, you love this kind of book. Why don't you read it and do it? And I was like, OK, sure, done. Um, so I'm reading it now. It's really good. Um, it's going in directions I didn't quite think it would, um, which is not a bad thing. Just it's sprawling and expanding in ways I didn't quite experience, uh, expect. And, uh, it's good. It's really good. That's cool. Yeah. I've got so many of these things. I'm doing a bunch of stuff for BA, but I still have like six books I have to read before May 4th and 11th. So you know how you feel. Um, but in relation to, to the, the reading the world thing, I did read diorama um, by Rocio Cerrone a few weeks ago, back, it was a while ago, because I think it was when we first announced this, and poetry is, it's not, it's not a super long collection of poetry either, it's, um, only 75 pages, uh, long, and a lot of them are only a few lines, um, so my, my memory of it is a bit vague, because I only read it once, and poetry has that sort of effect for me, where I read it and have like a sort of reaction and then have to look at it a lot more to try and create some sort of intelligent thing to say. But I will say that I really liked the first poem is called, the first section is called pinhole. And there's a part called 13 ways to inhabit a corner, which opens the book and is essentially seemed to me at the time of reading it as if it was like sort of a floating consciousness describing a sort of room or party or thing that's going on. And it had very much like, um, 
going from image to image or spot to spot on the floor and the way that things are laid out. And I liked that quite a bit. Like, I thought it was a really, it was very um, imagistic without trying to be poetic in that way of like saying things or making it a metaphor. It was much more of just the way the words and the way that it kind of comes together um, is, is juxtaposed, like the juxtaposition and the way that it's kind of more of a mosaic was the sort of thing that I really liked. Um, but the whole collection is pretty, there's like a few sections. They all sort of come together as sections. And it's interesting because it does have diorama as a very visual sense to it. And it has a very visual sort of layout of trying to create both on the page and the way that things are laid out or the fonts that are used, when when things are italicized and when they're not. Um, the, and there's an inclusion of like an image of, a, I guess it's a molecule, gal, galoxalide. Um, that's drawn in there. So it has like a, a much more visual sensibility than some of the other poetry books that we've, well, I don't know, Monospace is very much that way too. But other poetry that I think of when I hear it, where it's more um, like the hearing, the sound, the rhythms, that's in here as well. And there's actually a video that we posted um, of her where she reads it. And she reads it like jazz music. Um, and it has like a kind of repetition and a sort of like uh, rhythm to it that she interjects and that she in- incorporates. But even that aside, it does have more of a visual sort of layout to it. And that's what made me really like it. And I can see why this won the, the Best Translated Book Award last year. Because it is um, dense and it's got a lot going on. And that's, that's all I've got. This is, like, this is like how I teach my class when I'm not prepared. <laughs> just, just say a bunch of stuff yes. to them that it sort of makes sense. <laughs> got it. But yeah, I highly recommend it. I think it's great. And I think the first part, the 13 Ways to Inhabit a Corner, which I'll include a post to the first, um, when I put this up, I'll include a link to the first post that I made about her describing this book and sort of setting it up and setting her up. Um, and there's a there's a couple excerpts in there so you can get a sense of it. But then one other thing, there's a picture even in it. So going back to the visual nature of it, to go along with her kind of rhythms, there's a picture of like a tiny bird's head on top of a stick, <laughs> which is kind of unnerving. Uh, and and kind of gross, but also interesting to just pop up in the middle of a poetry book. Interesting. Yeah, and she's like a fairly young poet. She's born in 72. Um, it has like a, uh, four books. This is her fourth collection, I believe. She's been translated a lot of different places and lives still in Mexico City. Um, and hopefully if I get to go to the Guadalajara Book Fair, I'd be able to actually meet her. And, uh, she was going to answer questions I hope she. I kind of hope she listens to this in some ways, and not well. I hope she listens to it and gets this part. I hope she skips over my bad rendition of trying to explain why her book of poetry is good. But um, she was very happy and willing to answer any questions or do an interview. And I started putting something together, and then got way distracted, so I was never able to pull it pull it off. But I think it's a great book, and I think she's probably she's a very promising author that's probably going to have more stuff in the future that people are going to going to really appreciate. All right. <laughs> I guess. anything to say i know nothing about this book i'm very sorry yeah so trying to finish the vegetarian very quickly so speaking of so i guess we should move on to that um okay. and this is where you wanted to say to make sure that this is absolutely a um spoiler warning moment that we are going to ruin this book and spoil it so if you don't want to know anything about the book if you're still reading it if you have anything like that this is probably the time to just shut down um, and go read it or go read something else or go listen to something else, but that we are going to have details. So if you're okay with that, listen on. If not, then goodbye, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. But uh, don't, don't leave too soon because we should announce what the next one will be, which is... The Dirty Dust, right? Dirty Dust, right? Well, I'm going to read the one called Dirty Dust. Ah, oh, damn it. That's what I have. Really? Yeah. Okay, I'll try and read Graveyard Clay. I'll probably take both of them because <laughs> I've read I've read most of Dirty Dust before. Oh, okay. Um, and and great. Well, okay. So just to situate this, we'll say this, and then we'll we'll let everyone who doesn't want to hear spoilers go for um for this next month for May. We'll talk about the Dirty Dust by how do you say his name? I don't have any idea. Mark, I, I think I'm, it's actually I'm, explained. Not a good try. He is Irish. That's, that's all I can say. Okay, so it's it, it, there, it is in the introduction. It's um, Martino Keen. Um, okay, is how you could say it. So Martin O'Keen um, is an Irish author who's I think passed away now. Um, yeah, he died in 1970. But he's like one of these great mid-century Irish authors and considered incredibly funny, incredibly wild, and had never really been translated because the book was so 
difficult and all in voices and about uh, people in the grave and talking to each other. Now, Yale pr- published a hardcover last year of The Dirty Dust, which was translated from the Irish by Alan Titley, and now they have the paperback of that available. At the same time, they released another version of it translated from the Irish by Liam Ma- McConamari and Tim Robinson that's called Graveyard Clay. Um, and so we want to read the two of them and, and, compare. and compare them. I'm going to take both of them with me. I don't know how I'm going to get exactly be able to get to all this, but um, so we'll see. We might we might be talking about this in June as well. But for anyone listening, we'll put up posts. I'll put up a post soon, and we'll put up the thing in the Facebook um, page as well. So if you have either one of them and want to start commenting or talking about the translations, go right ahead, and we'll incorporate all of that into the podcast. Um, you could also just email us at three percent podcast at gmail.com or email me directly, which is just Chad period post at, at Rochester. And we can incorporate any comments or questions or whatever you might have to say. Um, so yeah, so those are the, that's the book, which is two books, I guess. Yeah. The next one. Um, okay. And anything else with that? No. Okay. Let's go on to the vegetarian. All right. You, okay. You read this a year a ago. ago year ago yeah okay i read it yesterday and today um with uh a lot of hype surrounding it and in the ether uh people i know people on twitter whatever saying how much they love this book i will just say as a blanket sort of statement about it that i don't quite understand why everyone loves this book (laughs) okay (laughs) I I felt it was very precious, the tone. Um, a little too too like I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It reminded me of like the movie Amelie, which many people like, but which I find incredibly incipient because it sort of insists on this worldview and this way of talking about the world that is just not realistic, that that I that just bears no semblance to reality. And to me, I guess what it was was like the characters, the, the three different narrators' sort of interior monologues, none of them sounded realistic. Like, none of them sounded like the way people actually think in their heads, I guess was my problem. That's what I mean by it sounded precious. It, just, it sounded very much like a written novel. Uh, Does that make sense? Like, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm struggling to sort of put it in words, but it, the style and the sort of language sort of got to me that way because it didn't. So, like, I, I always seem, seem to distinguish that between, like, uh, more modernist sensibilities, like the, and this is extreme, but like the Joycean, uh, Faulknerian um, internal monologues where people are repetitious and, and fragmented and, uh, and closer to, like, how uh, consciousness works versus, like, the more contemporary, digestible uh, imitation of how a, a mind thinks, but it's not really, it's clearly, like, written as a book. <laughs> That's what, right. you, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yes, that is exactly it. And uh, I mean, I guess I'm, look, taste, you can never argue with taste. Like, I prefer what you're talking about, the fragmented, the David Foster Wallace, the Javier Marias, sort of um, Thomas Pynchon, whoever else, sort of, and even like Clarice the Spectre uh, fits into this, where it's very much like mulling over ideas and obsessions and, you know, you do get the grittiness of changing minds and changing focus and all of that sort of stuff. Whereas this just felt very laid out. Like it's a story laid out and the interior monologue sort of was molded to fit that. If that makes sense. It's interesting. I don't know if you know this part of it, but it was initially written if Deborah is, will probably listen to this and will correct me if I have this story wrong, but um, from what I remember her t- telling us, because we had a lot of questions, this came up on the um, the Reading the World Book Club Facebook page too, with like how the second part of it reiterates a lot of stuff from the first, um, and that this was originally written as a short story or like a novella. Like that's not unusual in Korea to have very short um, books. Um, and that after the success of the first one or after the, the publisher really liked the first one, the first bit of this, then they told her to, to write more. So then they added on those next two sections, which is why the second section really is sort of repetitive because I think it was published separately as a, as a separate book. 
And the third does the same thing. And the third does the same thing. And I think that was also published separately. Although probably by that time, you're aware that there's going to be kind of a triptych to it rather than... Right. Rather than just, here's a new new thing from Han Kang. Um, That's interesting. I always... I, we, I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, but like when I was reading all of the Parker novels um, by Westlake, um, there's, you know, sometimes it's on page two, sometimes it's on page seven, this sort of thing that explains Parker's um, sort of working life versus personal life. Like when he's in job mode, he doesn't pay attention to his girlfriend, doesn't think about sex, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost verbatim in every single book. But they're individual books, and so you. But you know they're coming, and so you just like, all right, here it is again, and you know you skip three paragraphs and you move on. But it's there because you know they are individual books. Um, this it's a little weird that it's been published as one book, so that does sort of explain it. I don't know that it forgives it, unfortunately. I see, yeah, and I, I can see that. I know that my my students we use this in my class that has like um, the spring class where they read like seven to nine contemporary books and then have to argue for one that wins. And this one with a couple dissenters, um, and they really liked it because they had like part of, they were, they very much leaned towards the political aspect of, of prize giving, where it's like, well, a woman author from South Korea gets bonus points for being a woman from South Korea, um, was start of it. But then when they got into the book, they really liked the, the way that it portrays her without her ever having an, in her own monologue like she never gets to talk as herself and that the people surrounding her were really awful to her and awful people and then it, then it made them uncomfortable especially the teaching undergrads like the second section with the um the sort of weird erotic things the flower and all that um <laughs> always makes for strange classroom conversations um but they 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 were disturbed by that in like a way that they they really enjoyed from what I remember. We're like, we're intrigued by it and by the way that the, everyone was so mean to her and like what her kind of evolution as a character was without ever having a, a voice. They were sort of picking it up through those lenses. But I kind of agree with you that there's not, the three aren't that distinctive. They're all, they're all, there's a bit of like how it sets them apart, but not a lot. Um, I mean, you do, I mean, it's different to get the different perspectives. The, I mean, the other thing about the different perspectives is like, you know, three pages into the um, sister's husband's thing, like, you know, he says that he never liked the, his sister-in-law's ex-husband, right? Like, you knew that was coming. Like, there's nothing, nothing shocking, I, I guess, in, like, the shift of perception, except what he did, you know, and his sort of obsession with, you know, his sister-in-law, with his wife's sister. Let's just keep it simple and her birthmark and um that sort of thing i uh, two things before we get too far into this um one and i know this is another culture and i know i'm gonna sound really obnoxious here i had a hard time caring about this like veget her becoming a vegetarian plot because what the fuck it's what year yeah it is actually a real thing I looked up and I was like, it's 2007 and this is still a thing? It's still a thing like, now. I, I, is it really? <laughs> yeah. It's, was... I, the, the abusiveness of it in relation to her is excessive and is more, I think, the character's relationship there of like how... The how, father and... Yeah, yeah and, the, and, the, and the husband. But like when we were there, because um, I was there in 2015, 14, 14... Um, with Will Evans and Ross Uthberg, and Will Evans is a vegetarian, and it was almost impossible for us to eat anywhere. Like, there was nothing. There's never another option. Everything was fish, meat. There's no, it's just not, it's just not part of the culture at all. Like, the abusive, rec or the, the abuse towards her for it, I think, is based on the character, but like the idea of like how difficult it is, is actually really difficult still. There. It's just it's literally just not part of the, the way that they function. Wow. That's kind of amazing. I know. And it's a, it's a weird, because that is like one of the things that's tricky. I mean, there's two things I think that are tricky about this book on why it would get such a, a reception from like an American audience is that the vegetarian thing seems like not an, a non-issue. And then secondly, like that she does want to turn herself into a plant. Right. Um, but then also like the artist, the husband, the sister's husband, 
His art is like so uninteresting. <laughs> Painting a woman? Like, Jesus Christ. I mean, that was cool like 40 years ago. And like, this is supposed to be like some provocative sort of thing. Like, I've seen art from Korea. This is not progressive or transgressive in any way, shape, or form, right? But isn't he, isn't he sort of using that as like uh, an excuse for him to be able to get her naked? Yes and no. I don't know. I don't know where I eventually came down on that. Um, it was all sort of weird that the 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 culmination of that whole thing. There was when we first posted about this. It was on March eighth, and I wrote like a long introduction to it. So it's been a while, over a month. Um, and in, in, in the introduction, I said something about these people who are really shitty towards her. And on the Facebook page, there's a lot of responses of people. Or there wasn't a lot of responses. There's a response that led off into a conversation. Um, about how they didn't think that that her sister was a shitty person. Um, and, like, specifically, it says, like, I don't know how you say her name. Is it Yang He? Um, sister uh-huh. In He. Um, yeah. He says, is not a shitty person. She's normal at first. So he even begins questioning the normativity towards the end. At least that's how this one particular person read it. And then he goes on to explain, like, she clearly wasn't supportive in the first part, as indeed no one else was, nor could it be expected of her, though. She would have have had to break with so many social conventions herself, acting against social and family hierarchies, speaking as her father. It would have been almost inconceivable in this cultural context. In the third part, when everyone else has given up, she still takes care of her sister, out of social duty only, maybe, but she also begins to understand her and to question the norms herself and her position toward them. No question, though, that in the first place she plays that. First part, she belongs to the group enforcing social norms and therefore could be perceived as shitty as we associate with Young He's transgressive side. I like how my use of the word shitty is like the only way to describe these characters. But she is also just normal if we take into account the cultural context. Um, assuming he's like, if maybe someone with more information about Korean culture can weigh in on this, which um, is interesting because it's easy to like. Make the I remember this coming up in my class discussion where they're like, well, it's easy for the men to be perceived as bad, not supportive, shitty people, and for the woman, it's automatically seems for her sister it seems a little bit more sympathetic. But they ended up thinking that she was the worst of all of them because she was doing she was she was maybe going to visit her sister, but it's like dismissively. And then you pointed out a part on like three pages that from the end that I had totally forgotten about. That also seems to come out of nowhere in his in his. Makes and really characterizes her as a bad person by talking about how she abandons her child. Or she's made the decision to while in the ambulance with her dying sister. Which, that, I mean, that's not any better. But basically she's saying, I'm never going home. Like, I'm going to go live in the woods or whatever. Yeah. And, um, and get outside of the system, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't... I didn't I don't know that I would have finished this book if it weren't, you know, something we were going to talk about. Um, just, I, it, it had nothing to do with it, it, the translation or anything like that. I just think it wasn't for me. Like that kind of writing is just not something I'm drawn to. And, you know, I mean, we've talked about this before. I don't really like Murakami for the same reason. Like it, it becomes like a, this world that I don't necessarily enjoy sort of digging into you know it's got these fantastical elements and um you know dream sequences and all of this sort of stuff that i don't know it's just not a a, a thing that I'm, I'm dying to explore um and what was i gonna say totally lost my thread oh they also mentioned on the jacket copy that it was kafka-esque oh, that seems like garbage comparison that's that's a bit that's a bit of a stretch yeah it's not really Kafka because it's not really, yeah. There's nothing. There's nothing that that surreal is the wrong word, but nothing that that twisted around in the way that Kafka works. I don't like that one. That's just. I I wonder if that's just. I mean, that's just cheap shorthand publisher crap. Obviously, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's no way to be like. I don't think anyone really thought that through and has like a real defensible like you know PhD level explanation of how it's Kafka esque. It's just some copy editor. Right. Like, oh, people know who that is. Let's put that down. Someone doesn't someone in Kafka transform into something? Yeah, it's, that that seems about right. Let's, that, it's just like this. Yeah. So how many? You said there's a ton of review or a ton of praise in, in your version. I only have the UK version. Uh, give me a second. I'll I'll grab it and uh, see um 
if we're just mis- if I'm misreading it, if I'm just a, a simpleton, I'm not getting the, the point of this. Start review from Publishers Weekly, uh, Kirkus, some novel, some writers I've never heard of, The Guardian, The Independent, another The Independent, Irish Times, Joanna Walsh, uh, Times Literary Supplement, um, The Australian, man, um, something that is just called Linda. Uh, and then I think I don't know. I tore off the dust jacket, but I think there was more. I, yeah, uh, I don't have it. Hold on, uh, Sarah Gerard. Oh, really? Yep. And Deborah Levy. Yeah, I have that one. Vanity Fair, Laura Vandenberg. Like a lot of high praise here. That's wild. There, there are a number of reviews too. And then you know who really liked it is Porchista Kakpor too. She reviewed it in the New York Times. It was a long, big review. Um, you're still there, right? Yeah, okay. I'm just trying to make sense, like, if any of these... I mean, I did, like, Sarah Gerard's um, take on it. it. says, Visceral and terrifying, a startling reminder of the utter unknowability of another's mind. It is artfully plotted, yet reads like a fever dream, sweeping and surreal. It will leave you aching. In the UK, this ended up apparently landed on the Evening Standards bestseller list. Wow. Well done. Man. Who is in the UK? Uh, Portobello. Okay. There's, um, when I was talking to, to uh, Daniel Han about this, this came up um, when we were in Montreal, and he said that uh, her next book, Human Acts, is like even better, or is like far superior. So. I have a question for you that you might uh, be able to answer just because you, you're so much more familiar with Korean literature is where does she fit in? And as a writer, uh, where does, where does her work fit in in contemporary? She's, she's relatively young. I don't think that, I think that this might've been, I mean, it came out in 2007 and it was based on a short story. And I think that she only has a couple books so far. So she's still, um, pretty young in comparison to that. She seems closer to like the base wall, like that era of people, um, who's, yeah, she was born in 1970. Um, who's like a little bit more engaged with like body politics and things that are, uh, more contemporary issues and less of like the traditional, I, I and I don't know enough either. And Deborah could, could correct this. I've read the things that have been some of the, a lot of the things that have been translated, but not all of them and nothing that, that hasn't been translated and nothing that's super historic, but there are a lot of the books that come out that the ones that aren't poetry, um, a lot of them involve like the North Korea versus South Korea, the, the, the division between the two or like things about the kind of the transition into modernity for South Korea and like how there's a specific period in time in which everything there was built. Right. And like becoming like this kind of hyper, hyper capitalist place with um, the big Samsung and all those kind of places and how that's kind of affected their lives. Um, there's a lot of those kind of books and these ones seem to be more personal and more about like a mindset and more about like uh, a particular person's point of view in the face of like interpersonal relationships, less so about like the nature of the country, um, which makes them seem like very, I don't want to say like female, but in a sense, like the, 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 they're more in that Le Spectre vein of like interior in a way, not in the terms of the writing, but um, how she sort of like was revolutionary in the way that she was building off of what Rafael Cardoso did and making things like more interior to like how a person reacts rather than being about the fatherland or the country or like the bigger, you know, world vision, um, that they're quieter in that sense. And she seems to be fitting in within that. She has three books that are in English and four total, um, Han Kang. So yeah. And I think that those four total, I think those are actually two because I think that these are parts of the vegetarian, um, so yeah, so it's just really like the vegetarian and the human acts. And there's one called Convalescence, but I don't. I by that's published by Asia Publishers in 2013, whatever that might be. Um, but if you read like Nowhere to Be Found, there's a similar sort of uh, kind of groping nature to it in terms of like the defining a, a person against this landscape. And that that book also has like these. That book's I think better, um, but it also has these weird transitional moments where like this woman's doing one particular thing. And then there's like a set in scene where it's like kind of this like 
almost like um, sadomasochistic, like sex scene that comes almost seems like out of nowhere, but it is really good at like reflecting like the interior parts of this of this woman, this character. Um, and this has a bit of that, and then, but through like these other lenses. So I guess that's that's the best I can describe. But I, I someone with a lot would need a lot more information, or that's read a lot more of these books would probably be able to do a much better job of characterizing that. There is an article on in List magazine, the Korean Literature Center's magazine, that's about her and about like some of these these younger um, writers, female writers in particular, I believe. Um, that I can probably find and post on this or link to for, on this one. Um, I am also curious about like her style. Like, is it considered different? Is it considered, you know, progressive? Um, you know, what, what, what would we call it? Experimental in any way, or is it rather traditional just, I, or is it somewhere in between, like Le Spectre or something? I don't know. I don't think of it as experimental, or I think of it as a fairly straightforward. And that, like, I agree. Yeah. If there's anything that's supposed to be experimental, it's like the three viewpoint part. But that's not necessarily that's nothing new anymore. That is certainly nothing new. No. Um, and the, more about the idea of like, I don't. And this isn't new either. But the idea of like being different is going to get you destroyed, um, in one way or another, either through yourself or through other people's reactions to it. That's not really different either, but it is kind of more of a statement, I think, maybe within within that culture. One thing to go back to this, because this is funny, the Sunday, the, the book review, <laughs> not kidding about this either, um, from Porachista Kakpur in the New York Times, quote, ultimately though, how can we not go back to Kafka? More than the metamorphosis, Kafka's journals and a hunger artist haunt this text. And Kafka is perhaps the most famous vegetarian in literary history. He apparently once declared to a fish in an aquarium, now at last I can look at you in peace. I don't eat you anymore. Okay. Yeah, I don't really agree with that. But Yeah, I don't really either, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see it as too, too experimental. There are a lot of, just to, to keep on with this, there are a lot of comments on the, on the Facebook page, or a number of them. And I'll give you... Um, one that will back you up a little bit it says, uh, I have to be an out- this is from Joseph Schreiber. I have to be an outlier and admit that I was decidedly underwhelmed by this novel. The third part in the end was strong enough to redeem the overall experience, but the first two parts did not work for me at all. And I assume that it was simply a question of whether Korean and much Japanese literature fails to speak to me. I found our characters so coldly detached and cardboard, especially the men, something that was markedly improved in the much more intensely surreal final section. I wonder if anyone else had a reaction like this or if it was just me. Yeah, I, my problem was not that it was cold. It was just that um, it was just sort of lifeless writing. I just didn't didn't feel like I was transported. And, you know, if you're going to use an interior monologue as your device, as your viewpoint, it needs to really have its own voice and style, and be uh, you need to feel like you're privileged to be hearing what you're reading or whatever. You no know, mixing uh, perception there, but I just didn't feel that way. Um, and I think part of it was like I, I just kept seeing these phrases where I was like, "No one thinks that. No one thinks that. No one thinks that." And I don't know. That's just it. It just felt so writerly. I think was my problem. And I know that's like, look, you could say that about a million writers that I probably love. It's just I don't know for whatever reason the combination just didn't work for me personally someone did exp- did have a reaction that, that i'll just share here um since it makes sense so saying having read a lot of japanese literature recently but not being an expert by any means i would still admit the uh, hypothesis that it may be the culturally determined social convention of having to appear somewhat detached or quote-unquote cardboard in public life in these countries especially compared to the opposite convention the u.s appeared jolly and upbeat that reflects on your perception of these characters Meaning, if culturally one doesn't expect them to individualize themselves more than that in public, formal family circle included, one cannot be disappointed that they don't in the corresponding parts of the novel. In the third part, they're either un- unhinged in he or downright crazy yang he, and we have access to their thoughts or inner points of view, so that makes them more human, and we have more access to their complexity. So culturally, I read the relative flatness of most of the characters at the beginning is a cultural background against which Ying He's rebellion is so powerful. Um, that's a different different spin on that, um, which I get. I, I totally understand that. But yeah, I don't know. It's just too jaded, I guess. Too cynical. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, I'd be curious to see how this does in the U.S. compared to the U.K. I knew it got a ton of attention, the bestseller list and all that kind of stuff, but I haven't heard too, too much about it in the U.S. since that first wave of publicity. But then again, no one talks about books after the first 20 seconds. After you put it on your list of, like, whatever, 10 books to read for, for April, then it's done, right? Yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah, we're... It's my jaded. Never get any follow-up. No, no, there's never a follow up. Just, just to just make a new listicle. Um, yeah. Which, hey, I'll offer some follow up. Okay. <laughs> Which, uh, if Jeremy Garber is listening, I um, am very appreciative that you sent me a copy of the, the little book Zero K. I, however, however, thought that book was garbage. Um, and this is coming from a huge <laughs> Don DeLillo fan. It pains me to say that, but man, what a disappointment. Wow. Uh, I went from very excited to very disappointed. So. What, what is this? What is this one about? Um, a billionaire old man uh, starts, or, you know, it started long before the book began, but has a sort of um, cryogenic facility somewhere in the Balkan Mountains or, God, I don't know, the Euro Mountains or something like that. And uh, his son... Um, goes to visit it for the first time because uh, the man's wife, the son's stepmother, so it's the second wife, uh, is dying and, you know, they're all communing and talking about, uh, you know, life, death, science, technology, whatever. Which is all fine. I just feel like this book probably has been written a million times already. Um, He's just a little late to the game for this kind of thing. It also reads, oddly, a lot like The Names, which is not my favorite to little book, but one yeah. I, I did enjoy quite a bit. But it was also a tough one to get into at first. Yeah. Uh, but I did like it in the end. That's the thing. Um, it just felt like a little bit too similar to a book he had already written, which I know that's what you get when you read Don DeLillo. I mean, part of the joy is reading the dialogue and, and the way his characters sort of think and react to the world, um, the quick wit, I, you know, I love it, but yeah, this, this one, I just talking about cryogenics and, you know, mm-hmm. technology just did not interest me. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I don't know. I don't have anything else to add. I'm not going to order that Delulo book because of your recommendation. <laughs> if you stumble across a paperback next year, you know, Give it a go, but yeah. for some reason I thought it was already out, but I just looked and it comes out in May. Yeah, early May. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've been reading a bunch of stuff, but mostly for uh, you know what you know what you know what you if you haven't read, which you really should, which is fantastic, and I'll make a recommendation. Is I did at Blue Metropolis. This could be my rave, I suppose. Um, Blue Metropolis Festival is great. Um, it's all in like one hotel, so it's fairly confined it's not super super huge the way that pen world voices is but they had some really good authors there like um abdraman wabiri like uh valeria luiselli and like the two people i interviewed um and i moderated a panel with was uh aj somerset who wrote a book about guns for biblioasis called arms the culture and credo of the gun that sort of looks at the craziness of gun culture as from the point of view of someone who owns lots of guns and hunts and like enjoys having guns and was a shooter in the army and like has been around guns for a long time but looking at like the the way the history and the way that things have gotten all fucked up but then the other one was gabriella coleman who did that hackers hacker hoaxer whistleblower blower spy book about anonymous and that book is fucking wild i'd read like half of it last year on um like a e-version um when i was like bike riding at the gym when I had hurt my knee. Um, and then when I stopped doing that, I put it aside and never went back to it. And then I went and read it for this to talk to her. And like the second half of it's like almost like a, a thriller. Like it becomes crazy because she's involved with anonymous embedded writing about them as an anthropologist. While this guy Sabu is like one of the big anonymous hackers is working for the FBI and has flipped and is like basically with the FBI's knowledge um, and possibly involvement, directing people to attack various companies and countries across the world for years before the FBI decides finally has to then go arrest everyone. But basically, having like doing the dirty, he was like a traitor helping or um, a traitor to Anonymous, but had flipped and working for the FBI and like led people to 
do all the bad stuff that the FBI doesn't want to get their hands dirty with. Um, but it's a really cool book about anonymous and about their, their, like their, how they came to be and like what, what sort of span out of that and how things worked. Like one of the funny parts of that book is they're um, apparently hacked at one point in time NPR site and put up a, um, uh, a story that was like a dead serious, like overly serious story about Tupac being alive um, with the notorious B.I.G. in this place in, like, New Zealand, <laughs> in this in this town. They had pictures of them and all this kind of stuff, which I think is one of the, which is, like, great kind of hoax. I love that kind of stuff. Jesus. <laughs> because it's NPR. Like, right. Who, who wouldn't believe that? Um, but anyways, that book is great. Uh, do you have any rants or raves? Oh, you know, we did have mail, too. Oh, we have so much mail. I know we do. I don't know if there's any that's like worth exactly talking about. Um, Let's do it next time because uh, we've probably lost listeners. Because uh, very true. Yeah. 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 There's. I mean, the only. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, although I, I do have one other re- thing related to that because one of them is from Douglas Singleton. And he says, "I know three percent no longer does sports." And I want to say that when I was in Montreal, I met someone. I met this guy Peter McCambridge, who's starting a press called QR um, Books that's based on Quebec Reads, which is a site he runs that does uh, contemporary Quebec writing, um, which sounds pretty interesting and gets no play, obviously, outside of Quebec. Um, and he said he likes listening to the podcast for our baseball talk. <laughs> he encouraged more baseball talk. <laughs> Doug, Doug is a is a big baseball fan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, no, he is a Yankees fan. Which, ugh. Yeah. yeah. Are they? I, they're not even. They're not. They're sort of becoming more irrelevant. So I dislike them less. If that makes sense. Uh, sure. That does make sense. Unlike the frat boy, cub team that I can't stand, and which is just going to beat the shit out of the Cardinals for three straight days, and then rub it and my Twitter face constantly. Um, anyways, do you have a rant or a rave? <laughs> uh, no, I guess just ranting against the Lillo will have to be enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Well, I'll shut it down and then we'll, uh, we can record in a couple weeks. And, okay. Uh, probably a couple weeks would put us right at the best friends and book awards. So why don't we do one in a couple weeks in which we talk about it before it's announced. Okay, then we can post it uh, once it is announced. Exactly. Um, Okay, so anyone listening, talk to you soon.